Thank you. Uh, obviously, my name is here, uh, Ai Jun Song. I'm an associate professor in the EC department uh, at the University of Alabama here. Uh, my lab is called Mu Lab. Uh, a lot of my members are here. Um, and I'm going to talk about toward underwater mobile networks with autonomous vehicle. So the autonomous vehicle we are talking about are here. Uh, this is the uh, EcoMapper uh, YSI product. Um, autonomous vehicle, and this is another one. This is the newest uh, product from a company called Jaibot, uh, uh, Jaibot Robotics. So this is uh, Jaibot. Um, so what these uh, robots do, or what, what they are uh, commissioned to do, is to do uh, ocean survey and um, Basically, it's a self-propelled underwater research vehicle. It is just uh, coming to um, this shape, torpedo shape, because it started that way. <laughs> the first uh, uh, AUV uh, was created in 1950, as you can imagine, for defense purpose. So first couple of decades, it, it was that way. but Starting in the 1990s, uh, MIT uh, Wuzhou uh, uh, Oceanographic Institute, they start to use this for ocean survey, Arctic and uh, where's ocean missions. And then nowadays, there are quite a few models. Uh, we are lucky to have this one, which is also here, uh, EcoMapper YSI. And the most exciting trend is that those vehicles now becomes this, yeah. So, so what's, the, what's the change over almost a century is that the size, big reduction in size or weight, you know, this is probably <laughs> 10, pan, uh, uh, 10, um, 10 tons, right? Um, and here uh, it's this one, this one, it's seven pounds, seven pounds. And, um, and the price-wise, this the uh, uh, Navy investment, probably, I don't know, I, if, if I want to put a number, at least $10 million. And this device, or let's start with this device, this device is $200,000. And this device, this instrument, it's gonna be uh, around 10, 20,000. So the price, the, the size, everything has gone through several order, order of magnitude um, transformation. Now, it's, I, I say, it's really the time this kind of vehicle can make an impact. Um, that, that's, that's the reason, um, I'm using those uh, for, for uh, the current literature will tell you uh, people use that in all kinds of ocean survey and uh, oil and gas industry and offshore aquaculture, they, they start use this. And again, the USGS is really into this. They think uh, this is gonna be the future for survey in a small, body of water. Um, um, so um, again, we are very fortunate. Uh, we have these vehicles. We use them in different settings. And um, let me see if I can play. Um, yeah, this is really plays here. So this just show you how easy to deploy. Right? Uh, this is the, my student, Kai who is also here, just showed it, you know, it's deployed. And uh, of course, beforehand, you need to program a little bit where to go and how to do sampling, uh, but that's, all, that's a little bit uh, softer computer, uh, computer setting and just put it up, the track, everything, but it's, it's very easy uh, uh, deployment. And the cost, 
now is, uh, is almost affordable, okay? And so I, I think that's uh, overall a little bit introduction about the vehicle. Uh, in this 40 minutes, or, uh, I will talk about how we use those vehicles, starting with single vehicle, and then, uh, then next I'm gonna talk about what's the technology so that we can do connected vehicle. Of course, it's a little bit different from the connected vehicle on land. It's connected underwater vehicle. And last, uh, I will probably gonna present some animation to say, you know, if you have a connected vehicle, what we really wanna do with it, okay? So that's the uh, structure. <laughs> the, the vehicle, this vehicle has already a couple of sensors, temperature, uh, salinity, you can install it on the front, and there's a nose cone here. You basically can install any sensor you like, yeah. And itself has uh, acoustic sensors on the bottom uh, to probe the uh, water depths. Uh, the DVL sensor also used for navigation. So you can use those sensors very easily, as I said, just program the mission. For example, here, I, I don't know when we did it, but this is, uh, I don't have an exact date, but we just have a couple of mission planned in the Lake Tasusa, and, and we, we deployed it, and it come back with data. This is the Bessemic Plus. And this is gonna be readily applied to other sensors. If you have an interest, you wanna use this vehicle, uh, we, we definitely welcome, because um, we wanna use this vehicle as much as we can. And uh, there's no much really cost, because my students, they already been paid for, uh, uh, my time has already been paid for. Um, so that's the um, first one. The second one, uh, I'm an acoustic person, so with this, the immediate things I was thinking about is how to do acoustic measurements. But with, with acoustic measurements, the, the, the little bit difference is that uh, first, you need to have a device to measure acoustics, right? We have the device. And so we want to measure the acoustics, so we, we can just attach it to the to the hull, the vehicle, which is doable. You just make it uh, buoyant, uh, 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 neutrally buoyant, and attach the vehicle, and you can do the measurements. The other thing is that uh, I list the uh, frequency of the acoustic here, is that at this 85 kilohertz transmission, the, the field we call it, because we're gonna do a transmission in a lake and then the whole lake is insonified. Uh, and we're gonna use this vehicle to map the field. And the little bit issue is that the acoustic wave propagation is really fine scale. So the fluctuation spatial domain is pretty, pretty significant. And uh, we, we did a test and this is the uh, mission grid uh, the student made, and um, it comes back with the data as the acoustic measurements. And again, uh, this kind of measurements, you look at it, it's very dense, but it's not. It's very sparse, very sparse, because again, acoustic uh, field has uh, very fast fluctuation, so this we estimated we only have 10% of the sample uh, uh, for the field. So there's a need to do so-called interpolation, and people immediately thinking about this, oh, you have a sparse sampling, and then how about you compress sensing? And in our case, the compress sensing is not really available, although we really wanted to, to do, because compress sensing, the condition is that your measurements is kind of random. You, you have to do random measurements uh, in time domain or the original domain, and you sample the sparseness uh, in the uh, transform domain, that's why you can recover. So the students come up some uh, a smart algorithm, 
and it's called a creaked compressance you need to first do the uh, creaking and then you know uh, combine with compressance and there's a very nice idea behind it um, so the, the students published a couple of papers on that um, so that's the second case the third case which she will be showing in the uh, follow-up video after this is the mapping of underwater forest. It, it's not uh, our work, but it's we, you know, our team got invited by uh, the scientist um, Christine DeLong from uh, Louisiana State University. And, you know, they, they have this ongoing investigation. What it is, is that off Alabama coast, um, I cannot say where, but it's in uh, south of the coast, and uh, they um, they found an underwater forest. And um, the diver initially found it in the freshwood, and they tested it. Uh, they, they dated. I, mean, I have a piece of wood. Yeah, I I didn't steal it. They gave it to me. I just kind of claim, and it turns out. This piece of wood, um, uh, the age uh, is 60, about 60,000 years old. It is beyond the carbon dating uh, range. So then they got really interested in it because it's the ice age basically has annual forest, was buried, and then sea level change and is buried it and under the, the sea surface. So. Since 2013, they uh, started to make survey and sh use ships and diver. They say, well, what about, you know, uh, I heard uh, Adrian has this vehicle, nobody's gonna use, so maybe we can use it. Oh, we, uh, yeah, I mean, I was excited and we had a plan, uh, 2022, and we made a trip last year. Basically what it is is that we installed a video camera Oh, by the way, this is the map where they are. Um, we are not allowed now to show the coordinates by anything, but this this is, block, this is the squares. They suspect there's a forest. This is the, the location they suspect the forest. It, one mark is basically a city block. Imagine if you want to use a diver to survey a city block. It's it's impossible. So this kind of vehicle is really fitted for this kind of survey. Uh, again, uh, it's a joint work. We, we don't, I, I cannot claim we did much, but we, the vehicle did help them a lot. You know, it's a very short mission uh, of four, uh, four days on board. And the first two days was really, really like baby. Uh, and I was, I was like, uh, Seasick <laughs> all the time, uh, but uh, we have the this we call um, uh, Dr. Clemens here. Not uh, we borrowed from him, and we also had an autonomous vehicle, and uh, you know easily we identify couple uh, size they have the 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 wood or the forest. So that's the uh, third answer. So we we with that. Oh, okay, this is the picture, one of the uh, picture from the ROV is very clear. And so if you compare this picture, so this is the uh, early picture from the underwater forest. You can see the clear, that's the wood, and this is the stump, right? And to this day, because of the seawater and everything is highly corroded. Yeah, like this. And it's almost, uh, I mean, if, if, <laughs> if she didn't tell me, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, they told us this is the forest corroded um, in a seawater environment. Okay, so that's the part. Uh, we, we have a couple examples to use the single vehicle, right? And with single vehicle, you, you say, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's probably you can do. And that's how the standard practice, other researchers, scientists are using it. And the next stage, of course, is that what about 
you know, can we do connected vehicle? Can we do multiple vehicle? Coordinate, maybe do synchronous diving, right? <laughs> uh, those kind of things, right? So a necessary tool is yeah, underwater wireless communication, yeah? And that's actually my, I was trained in this field. <laughs> so that's actually my home research field. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of options. You can do optical uh, wave communication underwater. And uh, Dr. Uh, Nina Pu is here. She has done uh, familiar with that. You can do electrical magnetic waves uh, communication underwater. You can do magnetic induction. There's uh, probably you know four options. Of course, the last option is acoustic. The top three options is just meant to for short range, and also not only short range. They have some kind of limitation because optical, it's optical, so it's line of sight, and also the performance is really depends on the direct directionality, and uh, it also depends on the scattering uh, of the uh, optical waves. So uh, short range, if you do want to do high speed, consider optical, electrical, magnetic wave, magnetic induction, but well, a vehicle cannot do short range when they do communicate because this vehicle usually travel in kilometers, in you know one to ten kilometers, right? You really need to consider uh, longer range, and that's how um, we pinning down. Say we have to do acoustic, yeah, and it just happens so that I you know working uh, mostly for acoustic communication field, and. But acoustic communication and our cell phone technology is different. It's, it's, I mean, same principle, but application uh, domain is different. There are uh, three fundamental differences, okay? If we compare underwater acoustic with uh, your, your cellular phone technology, you know, everybody has a cell phone in your pocket, right? And and nowadays is so-called 5G, and 5G is a little bit short range, so it's fair to kind of compare acoustic between uh, between acoustic and uh, 4G network. So three things stands out. First thing is so-called bandwidth. So bandwidth is the uh, information highway for you to do call. You know, if you think about your 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 downloading or your call, or your video chatting, it actually is like uh, information travels through the information highway, right? And bandwidth, the information highway, and for a cell phone is probably 50 megahertz. And here in acoustic, it's only several 10 kilohertz. It's like they have thousand lanes, we only have one lane. So, that make a really difference in the data rates. Not only that, in your cell phone, you use the radio frequency, uh, 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 radio frequency uh, uh, waves and uh, electromagnetic waves. The travel speed wave has a significant difference. Again, you know, EM wave is five order of magnitude faster, and acoustic is five magnitude slower. That has implication too. We, we actually have active research doing that for, to compensate for that. And the last thing is, when you do acoustic communication in the water environment, uh, there's an effect called multipass, which is echo. In uh, the comparison between underwater and RF is that the um, uh, Acoustic has extensive multipass is about four order of magnitude worse. So with this factor considered, and you can see a lot of the difficulty, I can go into explain what uh, multipass is because uh, that's the only place I have equation. Other than that, I just have this <laughs> show and tell here. I, I can talk a little bit about it. Multipass. Multipass is pretty straightforward to explain. If you are in the ocean or uh, in, inside a body of water, 
and you want to do acoustic transmission, not only you have, so this is a transmission, and this is a reception, right? And the reception, transmission, you transmit a pulse, say, and then reception, you're going to have direct copy of the pulse received, and you can have bottom bounce, you have a surface bounce, right? Yeah, that's the multi-pass. But for us, it creates a serious problem because when you do communication, you basically do sequential waveform transmission, a sequence of the pulse. And if you, each of a pulse, we have echoes and all of them are gonna jumble up. And this is kind of effects we call convolution. And uh, I tell students, convolution is bad because it's called convolution, okay? And not only that, and this, this convolution can get even worse. And this picture just show you if I, you know, send a single uh, pulse, this is what I receive as a, uh, at the receiving side. You get echo, 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 and a lot of echo later, right? And, and a quarter of seconds, you send another uh, pulse, and the echo pattern actually changed. So this is called time varying uh, impulse, uh, impulse and time varying multi-pulse and those parted out like this and if you do color intensity plot, it change over time, it will change over time. So again, this is the only place I have equation to show is that and this change over time is going to be captured in a huge matrix like this. And S is your information, send it. And this H capture time varying multipass. And this is your reception. And as communication person, we've been doing uh, recover of S. Uh, based on what we received as. Uh, that's pretty much what we've been doing uh, for quite a long time. And, and actually, uh, this is my next page here. The Office Naval Research paid us to do that, uh, figure out this trick, how to recover S uh, in light of the big H matrix and they invest quite a lot. They invested multiple um, large-scale SC experiments and involved all the top universities. Uh, I was a, a software uh, 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 position a scientist as I was part of the consortium. And uh, so, yeah, we, 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 we went to the ocean and data collection, we also came up with ways to, to compensate the complicated time varying multi-pass. Uh, we published papers, we, we get results. A uh, couple of things. First is that previously people think about, oh, acoustics is not reliable because you have this terrible, this terrible H. Uh, we, we show that Indeed, you can come in so for the age, you can do very reliable uh, communication in the ocean environment. And so this table just show that, so this column is the code name for the large scale SC experiments. Probably, you know, if you do field work, you guys do the same. So the first one is Kawaii EX, Kawaii X 2003, Makai, EX 2005, and this SWO6, and CAM 08, CAM 11, this is like, you know, miniature stuff, like code names, right? But that just represents different time of the experimentation happening at the sea, and you, they have the data rates listed, we have a range listed. Of course, this is the, the system we, we used, and this is the period of com communication achieved. So you can see, there's a significant time span. We show that we can do acoustic communication. We also, uh, you know, show some good numbers in a smaller number of data rates, four kilobits per seconds, and 
and the smallest the four point uh, zero point four kilobits per seconds, and then the highest number is thirty two kilobits per seconds. There are even higher numbers by some other method, but it's it's around the same level. And we were happy about it, and we published paper. That's what we do in academia, right? And um, just want to point out is that what what does this system mean? Is that so? Example: this this means four transmitter, sixteen receiver. So the receiver, if you can see, uh, one of the receivers, this here is probably eight mm's. It's like two or three meter high. So you can do acoustic communication at reliability, uh, a reliable way. You can do it with this race, we claim, but you need big instruments. Okay, that's take home message. Um, I, I prepare another part of the this 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 work. I kind of skip uh, skip because uh, it's break my promise. I have more equations here. Gonna yeah, it's a skip that, and uh, also I, I don't have enough time. Yeah, anyway, and um, uh, we we think we made progress, but during that period, another thing also happened is that cell phone technology really takes off. Okay, 2007, Steve Jobs, you know, showcased his iPhone, okay? <laughs> so, uh, our growth, and we, we make uh, a announcement, but if you put in this growth chart of the cellular technology, and it's really nothing, you know, it, it's really nothing, okay? So cellular technology started called four, uh, first G. Uh, first G is, means first generation of digital technology. It is the, uh, is the big, it's like this big. Um, it, it's, um, what is called? What is called? Do you know anybody like, don't be afraid to expose your age. What, what's called? They put it here. Uh-huh. The, the big cell phone, the first generation one. That's the first generation, yeah. It, it, it still shows in some game movies that the, 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 the gangster, you know, used that. It's very cool, <laughs> And that's the 80s. And 90s, that's kind of uh, second G. Second G, GSM, is a very famous one. You can do fax, or, uh, you can do uh, some voice, uh, 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 you can fax, you do fax uh, wirelessly. And the third G, uh, you can do so-called uh, mobile uh, broadband. Basically, you, you can uh, watch some animation and uh, some uh, data transmission there. And of course, 4G is pretty recent, it's 2011. So in time, we were between 3G and 4G uh, when the cellular is going through this transformation, but for underwater, we stop. The data rates, we stop at here. Sometimes we hear, sometimes here. We only can do very limited facts, the, 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 the facts machine, the data transmission, that level. So, this is not good, especially in eye of the federal funding agencies, <laughs> okay? Um, but you, you say, you know, you guys are just a bunch of scientists. Uh, probably, you know, the, the industry is going to do much better than you, you know? No, they are not better either. The reason is because the physics, the three things I mentioned, acoustics have much less bandwidth has much slower uh, wave speed and has much worse echo patterns. And that's the, that's the constraint. Uh, so for example, this is the leading uh, uh, vendor of the acoustic modem. It's called Teledyne. And this is their modem. Their data rate is listed here, uh, 2.5 kilobits per seconds, and 
2.4 kilobits per second or 80 bits per second. It's very, very limited. 80 bits, you cannot even send email, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and another thing is that those numbers, you have to take it with a grain of salt, <laughs> okay. It's, you, you don't look at the upper number, you look at lower number. <laughs> you know, that's, that's with advertising. So, and, you know, the old office neighbor research, they just told us, oh, now realize our priority has changed. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I, we were still hopeful. I, that time I actually transferred to UA. I still sent proposals to OMR. And, um, you know, now, retrospect, <laughs> I know why it's rejected, right? But, but back then, I, I, you know, reach out and talk. They say, oh, interesting, yeah. And welcome to send a planning letter and proposals. And I did. I reject once and reject twice and reject three times. And then I say, okay, maybe it's route to, to do uh, uh, NSF. And um, yeah, one day I was in the office, uh, you know, I got a call from a National Fun uh, Found a Science Foundation. And the guy on the other end of the phone uh, said, oh, uh, Adrian, I, I got your proposal. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting direction. Um, you know, how, how about we start like small and you, you, you uh, uh, organize a workshop for us and then that's how it goes, right? So basically start from that phone call and um, there are a lot of exciting things happened for my lab. <laughs> and um, the NSF uh, commissioned us to organize uh, two workshops, basically to figure out, okay, now uh, underwater wireless is not for OMR, but this discipline, discipline, this field should not go away. What should we do, right? And uh, we, we had a meeting, you know, it's, uh, the, the scientists from US, Asia, European, they all joined. We had um, extensive conversation because, because of what Omar backed out and a lot of people just dissipated. And so this field is dying out for US. It's not for Europeans though, okay? It's for European, Asia is a very booming <laughs> area for, uh, for, for research. So, the, uh, we have a consensus that if you want to grow, we need to build better infrastructure. We, we can uh, uh, support other scientists who have interest to join. Uh, we need to be open-minded. We, we need to develop open source hardware, software, and so that everybody come and use. The other point is that, uh, you know, uh, it's not all of them, but me and a couple of colleagues is very, very into uh, getting a marriage with another discipline, uh, underwater robotics. So that's pretty much the direction uh, I, I, I've been taking since then. Um, for example, uh, right after workshop, uh, workshop, a uh, couple of years, uh, a couple of colleagues and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, me, we get together. So this is the uh, involved institution, Georgia Tech, and City College of uh, New York, uh, Michigan Tech. Uh, we, we got a, uh, NSF funding to do um, MuNet uh, infrastructure. That's actually how I uh, named uh, our lab, uh, my lab. Um, the MuNet uh, is a community shared open source infrastructure to promote mobile underwater networks. So mobile underwater network mobility, it just means the mobility caused by the vehicle, okay? So there's uh, different components, uh, everything. Basically, it is just follow the community's consensus to build the open source hardware. For example, Georgia Tech uh, building these miniaturized robots, they are building some 
uh, acoustic modems, and we actually have one of modem here. I'm going to uh, talk about it a little bit later. But for us, we have the luxury of uh, the AUV. So at UA, at the uh, University of Alabama, uh, we are developing this lake test bed. Basically, uh, is that we have two AUVs, and we're going to use uh, commercial um, acoustic modem, and there's a company allow us to modify some of the software inside, the acoustic modem is installed inside, and we're gonna uh, build its infrastructure for data collection, maybe a little bit later we do um, communication test. So uh, for this project, the, the um, the one of the thing is again, you know, because of uh, acoustic modem or the acoustic research, acoustic modem research is still not very advanced as cellular. So, any if you want to put an acoustic modem, which is the acoustic communication device, in a vehicle, you have to figure out a way to integrate. Um, this vehicle has a self. Um, uh, software to do robotics, navigation, everything. And we have to use a certain way to integrate the acoustic modem software with robotics. And um, I, I, I think I can skip a little bit, but um, you know, my students here, uh, uh, a lot of them was involved in a work to do integration. Uh, basically, a lot of times it's coding work to figure out how the robotics works and how the communication uh, pro networking product st stack works and they uh, merge them together. Uh, again, those, uh, those merging is not very uh, <laughs> straightforward in a lot of cases. So again, uh, we, we did that, and this is one example of um, the, the test. For We did integration so that the AV has acoustic mode and we can communicate acoustic mode in real time. So this is one of the, the, the tests we showed. What it is is that on the top is the, uh, it's a, a rectangular mission uh, we, we did it in uh, Lake Tarsusa. You see, the vehicle was deployed on the left, and then it goes out, make one, two, three, four loops, and then come back to the deployment, okay? So this is the standard way uh, the other scientists or the um, uh, commercial products is used, but we, were able to integrate acoustic with robotics. So when the ro uh, robot go to, uh, ha of course, had a, had a mission, pre-programmed mission, and the vehicle goes through here and here, and then we send the comments to the robot. Say, OK, do a dance, figure eight. Yeah, the, the, the robot received the uh, command and indeed do a, do, did a, like a figure eight movement. And after uh, the, the figure eight, it went back to the, the program mission. So this way, it, it's programmable. Uh, it's, you can have remote control with the vehicle. So with that integration, uh, you know, because it has acoustic uh, uh, autonomy integrated, we did lake test. Uh, with that, we will be able to do uh, data collection, uh, and, and we actually, the data has been shared with multiple university. Uh, one of the university has published multiple papers on the collected data. Uh, so now, we have one vehicle working, and then uh, I think soon we can have two vehicles. They can talk to each other in the field. To us, is a big thing. I mean, it's it's very unique uh, infrastructure uh, 
United States, I don't think any labs has that kind of thing. Uh, it's two vehicle, both uh, installed or integrated with acoustic mode, and they can do a, a, a communication coordination, and you also have two fixed mode and communicate with this mobile platform. So we, we did this integration, and we can do a small scale mobile network. Um, you know, I you know, this is this is our goal. Uh, since 2018, we, I mean, we are, haven't done this part, but I, I'm sure it's going to be really really soon. So, so at this this phase, we say, okay, we can do small network. Okay, what's next? And uh, I, I showed my work to USGS, uh, and they were pretty excited. They said, oh, you can do this bigger vehicle. How about, uh, can you do something with this vehicle? So that's the third part of my talk I briefly going to go about is that the next stage, we're going to do uh, underwater swarming. Um, what is swarming? I mean, underwater swarming. Swarming is, exists already in air. You probably, in some kind of festivities in foreign nations, they're going to do drone show. They're going to do drone light show or drone and fireworks show. They do this group of, of drones in air, crazy dance, or some kind of um, uh, show some kind of movements, or show some letters, characters in air. Uh, and the drone, the swarming is feasible in air, is feasible on land, but so far it's not feasible underwater. And we, our, our lab, I think is at the edge of thing here, say, oh, you know, with this vehicle, with this type of vehicle, we can do underwater swarming. So then you better say, you're going to do just underwater drone show? Yeah, that's, that's fun. This is actually <laughs> some of the simulation. Uh, our students, uh, J.P. Crawford, has done. You know, yeah, probably can do some crazy dance like this. And, uh, but it's beyond that. It's beyond that. It, it's when you have a fleet of vehicle, when you have a fleet of vehicle, right? And uh, if, you, if you are interested in to do spatial sample, you got to get spatial sample. Not only that, is that you can also be adaptive. Uh, for example, you can chase the salinity front at some estuary or maybe some even uh, lakes. Uh, USGS actually is very interested in how to do that in Delaware River, okay? And, um, and you, can, you can map uh, some underwater plume Right? The plume can be oil spill, maybe some other uh, chemical or thermal events, right? So, for example, if you have this kind of plume, you want to identify the source. Or it's oil spill, you want to find a boundary. Single vehicle is not possible. It's not. It's not. And you want a, a group uh, vehicle to do that, right? So, um, the USGS is interested in that, and um, so they give us some funding to start off. Um, so now we are trying to uh, integrate uh, the open source modem. Uh, it, it looks ugly, but that's the that's the ongoing project. You know, we uh, it, originally is this bigger size, and the student, my students here, they redesigned it so it's small. It's going to be uh, small, can be put inside this. You say maybe you can buy this from 
uh, some commercial uh, line, right, you, uh, a vendor. No, you cannot because a lot of the time the transducer is always like this big and this is not going to work out. So we have to redesign the circuit so we're going to have very small transducer. I, I, I didn't bring the small transducer is going to be the size of my thumb. And you're going to have small transducers, small uh, circuits. Not only that, that your robot, in order to do this crazy dance thing, you, you really have to integrate deep. The communication and robotics, it has to be fully integrated. It's not only say, oh, my robot is going to do transmission and reception. Your robot needs to know everything comes out from acoustic reception, for, for example, timing. For example, the level of receive intensity so that your robot is aware of the neighbors, the peers, so the robot can follow on to do coordinate behavior. Okay? So that's the hardware and um, the software-wise, um, because we, we don't have the full fleet yet, I, I hope the USGS or maybe sometime or other, the US, uh, the, uh, the, uh, even Omar comes back or NSF come back to invest more, but for the time being, we are create some integrated simulation. We're gonna have ocean environment, and this is ongoing work, and we can create Underwater plume, actually I showed it, which is my students, Ashwan is working on. I has, yeah, um, the, we can have the, uh, in this uh, uh, software suite, we, will, we have the underwater weak home, uh, modeling work, a uh, model, and we are building the group behavior. We connect all this through the communication uh, networking stack. And, so the, the reason is that for now, even in academia, people haven't put it all this together. We just on the edge of putting this together and there's a lot of interesting, even science question to ask. Um, so this is the one of the <laughs> simulation, actually uh, JP just produced uh, last night, right? <laughs> yeah, but this is the, after the integration with the communication, you know, we will immediately find out that when the communication is a delay, the delay really affects your fleet behavior. And so uh, we, we got a couple questions to ask is that how to, how to minimize the delay? Uh, and also what's the threshold of a delay so that my navigation or uh, swarm is not affected. And there's a bunch of other questions uh, to be answered. Um, so, of course, we, we are not there yet. It's, again, it's an ongoing work. Um, they're, they're, that, that, that's pretty much I gonna pause on, yeah. And, um, do you guys have any questions? If not, I will finish this. Uh, so, you know, in my lab, I, I'm very lucky not only have uh, graduate students, also have a group of undergraduate students. Uh, for example, you know, this modem uh, was, I mean, is being developed at Georgia Tech, but we also have our in-house acoustic modem, they are actually divided by our undergraduate students, Brody, Annika, and Joyce, they are part of the team. You know, they showed it one time in the uh, water symposium. Um, yeah, and beyond that, um, we also did um, outreach work, uh, a robotics competition with high school students. And again, our undergraduate students play a uh, instrumental role to be the mentor for high school students um, uh, there. Um, that, that's pretty much it. 
um, I hope I can present the, uh, I, I, I have presented the integrated research educa education program center on the scene of underwater mobile networks. And uh, the, the work, I have a lot of the students to, to thank because we do field work. Uh, this is really weight lifting sense. <laughs> I cannot uh, lift it up by myself. It's uh, uh, at least three people uh, operation. Uh, and this one is single person can do it, but this is, uh, we need a group. So, and we also work with uh, uh, multiple uh, external collaborator and Georgia Tech, uh, Dolphin Island Sea Lab, University of Houston, CCNY, uh, City College of New York, and uh, Louisiana State. Okay.